Lakeland PBS, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2020, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now the Senate District 5 debate. Your moderator tonight is Bethany Wesley. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Debate Night 2020. I'm Bethany Wesley. This next debate featuring the candidates seeking to represent Senate District 5 opens our second night of state legislative debates. This week, Lakeland PBS is pleased to air nine state legislative debates over four nights of television. I'm coming to you tonight from our Lakeland PBS studio in Bemidji, but our candidates and our panelists are joining us remotely due to COVID-19. We're glad that they and you are still joining us tonight. The candidates seeking to represent Senate District 5 are Senator Justin Eichhorn from the Republican Party, and Rita Albright from the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Our panelists are Matthew Lidke, Bemidji Pioneer Reporter, Heidi Holton, Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE, and Dennis Wyman, Lakeland PBS News Director. Now, the rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will get three minutes for his or her opening statement, our candidates will then answer questions from our panelists. Some of these questions will be of the panelists' own choosing. Others may come from the public. The order of the candidates' responses will be rotating, beginning with opening statements and finishing with their closing comments. Each candidate will have two minutes for each question. Each candidate will also have the opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal. Tonight, our candidates will also have the option to deploy one-minute bonus time to add on to one of their answers. This can be used either during the initial answer or the rebuttal, but it can only be used once. Questions will continue until we are about 50 minutes into the debate, at which time we will wrap up the questions and move on to closing comments. Closing comments are two minutes each. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Opening the debate tonight will be Senator Justin Eichhorn. Justin, your opening statement. And I already messed up. I already didn't have me unmuted. So now we're good to go. Uh, first of all, thank you to Lakeland Public Television and uh, thank you to Matthew and Heidi and, and Dennis and Bethany for, for all of you for, for doing this for us. It's really important for the constituents of this district to be able to hear from us. So we appreciate you doing it even in these challenging times. So I'm State Senator Justin Eichhorn. I've had the honor of serving you for the last four years in the Minnesota Senate. I was born and raised in Itasca County. I've lived here 36 years my entire life. Uh, I live in Grand Rapids with my wife and four young children, William, Benjamin, Isabel, and Emmett. Um, I'm a business owner in Grand Rapids. Uh, I have some multifamily property. Uh, I also have been a member of the business community in Grand Rapids for many years. In the Minnesota Senate, I served on several committees. I was the vice chair of the Jobs and Economic Growth Committee. I was on the K-12 Finance and Policy Committee, the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, Capital Investment or Bonding Committee, Aging and Long-Term Care. I also served on the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Board and the School Trust Lands Board. Over the last four years, it's been an honor to work with Representative Lehman, who's now retiring. Uh, we kind of had the team thing going on, which was really great. We called it the SD5 team. I'm happy to have that going forward. Uh, it's been just an honor to, to work with Sandy Lehman. I'm looking forward to work with uh, with Spencer Igo uh, and hopefully Matt Bliss again. Uh, one of the greatest accomplishments we had was in the second year when in the bonding bill, we were able to get that veterans home across the finish line for Bemidji, something that's been super important for the entire region. So I was really excited to work with Sandy and Matt to be able to get that done. Ready to keep working for the people of Senate District 5 and ready to have this debate tonight and just wanna thank you again and hand mm -hmm. it off. All right, thank you, Justin. Rita, your opening statement. Thanks, Bethany. Well, hello. Uh, thank you to Lakeland Public Television for sponsoring this forum and for those watching at home. I appreciate this opportunity to speak directly to you and to the voters to tell my own story. I grew up in Northern Minnesota where my dad was the elementary school principal at Little Fork Big Falls. My mom worked at Boise Cascade. I moved to Bemidji to attend college where my husband Mike and I raised our family. We raised our two kids and we have five rambunctious grandchildren. I decided to run for Senate because like others, I'm disappointed with a lack of cooperation at the legislature. I've seen how the inability to agree in St. Paul negatively affects our communities. My Northern Minnesota upbringing and values have served me well in my personal and professional life, hard work, responsibility, and honesty. 
I've been a business owner and I know the challenges of finding workers, making payroll and paying taxes. I've been a planner at the local, regional and state levels and tribal planner at Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I recently retired as the Northwest Region Director for Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. I was elected mayor of Bemidji in 2012 and I'm now serving my fourth term. During the last eight years, we grew our tax base 36%. We permitted a record number of projects, including more than 400 new housing units since 2016. We helped two dozen downtown businesses renovate their buildings through our Small Cities Development Program. We've experienced the growth of new businesses, jobs, and industrial park expansion. Expanding our economy and growing our pie has allowed Bemidji to keep our tax rate low. In fact, our tax rate has been flat for the last five years, and that means if your property values didn't increase, neither did your city taxes. I'm well connected across the district from years of working with tribal communities, natural resource professionals, and elected community leaders. My background working in my community, running a business, and serving as a mayor has given me a broad understanding of this region. Leadership is about listening, bringing creative ideas to the table, and finding solutions. That's the leadership and experience I will take to the Capitol. I won't shy away from those difficult challenges that we're facing. And as your Senator, I will show up, do the work, and collaborate with local leaders to find solutions. As your State Senator, I'll focus on what we value most in Northern Minnesota. Good paying jobs, quality education and job training programs, the health care that people need, and protecting our outdoor heritage. That's the hope and optimism that I will take to the state Senate. We need to bring our best selves to get Minnesota back on track. I look forward to this opportunity for you to get to know me. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Rita. Our first question will come from Matthew. And Rita, you'll have the first response. Thanks. I wanted to start off the questions today by focusing on the coronavirus. Uh, so my first question is related to um, relief going forward. This current year, we've seen a lot of relief uh, from the government and also from uh, private agencies and organizations, but that can only go so far this year. As 2021 comes around and we try to get back to normal, how can the legislature help in keeping businesses afloat and keeping businesses running and help bounce back uh, from this hard year that um, they've had in 2020? Thanks, Matthew. That's a great question because we all want to get our economy back on track, our businesses back open, keep our kids in school, and make sure that people are able to have jobs that pay well. So uh, one of the things that we need to do is think about what is the long-term sustainability of, of our economy. But right now, one of our most important opportunities is to pass a jobs bill. Somebody calls that a bonding bill, an infrastructure bill, an investment in our state assets. That's a jobs bill here in Northern Minnesota. And so that would put thousands of people back to work. That would inject uh, a shot in the arm for our businesses here in this district. And we wanna make sure that we are doing whatever we can to, to help our businesses. That bonding bill is probably you know, what's, what's hard to understand is the fact that we all agree that a bonding bill is needed in Minnesota. Workers agree with that, businesses agree with that, politicians agree. The problem is that down in St. Paul, the Republicans have just stonewalled having a bonding bill because they want to try to um, make it dependent on the emergency powers or they want to make it dependent on a tax bill. And, and workers at home don't care. They don't care about that partisanship. What they care about is making sure they have a job. Businesses care about being open and making sure that they have uh, those dollars circulating in the community being spent at Main Street. So we all agree that uh, we need to get our economy back on track as your state senator. I'm gonna put aside that partisan policy, part partisan um, polarization and work on behalf of the people of this district so that we make sure that we are getting the jobs we need here in northern Minnesota. Thank you, Rita. Justin, your answer. Thank you. And Rita is absolutely correct that uh, 
businesses want to stay open. So it is absolutely time to open Minnesota up. Um, I think the shutdowns have gone on way too long. And that's what I'm hearing consistently from business owners throughout Senate District 5 and even outside of the district. They're sick and tired of the inconsistent mandates that are going on um, and the way that some of these have been used as a weapon against small businesses who may or may not agree with the current administration. That's been very unfortunate. I do agree that a bonding bill is extremely important. And we did put a bonding bill on the floor of the Senate in which every single Republican member voted for that bonding bill. And I bet almost every Republican would vote for a bonding bill again if we can get one on the floor. Uh, the way that happens is a bonding bill has to originate in the House. If we get an opportunity in the Senate, uh, a bonding bill still has my full support. The other thing we need to do is now that our hospitals, we have appropriated over $500 million to prepare our hospitals, to prepare our counties, prepare our Department of Health. And that's something we've already done. Now that we've done that, we need to make sure our critical access hospitals have the opportunities to continue to stay open. They've continued to be harmed greatly by these shutdowns. Um, so we need to find ways to help them as well. So that way, when we do get beyond COVID, they can stay open and can serve those smaller communities. Um, I think, you know, since we are prepared, there is other small business funding we probably need to look at. We can do that both through the IRRRB, the, through the Department of Economic Development at the state level and in conjunction with the federal level. Uh, we did see some of the PPP loans that are coming through that have been very important and are working. We're going to need more help from the federal government. There is more we should be doing at the state level as far as helping our small businesses out. And being on our jobs committee, I'm ready and willing to continue to take that fight. Thank you, Justin. Rita, would you like to rebut? The, the, the truth of the matter is that the policies that Governor Wallace is trying to put in place are hoping to keep our community safe and secure. So that safety is what we're looking at. And that's why we are trying to make sure that everyone is following the guidelines because it protects you, it protects your neighbor, and it keeps our businesses open, it keeps our schools open. And that's what we all want. And when we aren't following those guidelines, then we find that we have things like what's happening right now, spikes in our in our cases in, in Beltrami County and in, in, uh, in Itasca County as well. And the reason that the Democrats didn't support that bonding bill is because those bills need to originate in the House. And that one wasn't, it was a throwaway bill because it didn't originate in the House. Plus, it didn't have the really important needs that would take care of our communities here in Northern Minnesota. All right, thank you, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal? Once again, um, she's incorrect. It actually had the bonding project for Bemidji in there. It had projects for Deer River. It had projects for Grand Rapids. So some of those projects that are important to Senate District 5 were in the Senate's bill. And it was absolutely not a throwaway bill. There is procedural ways that the Senate can take up a bonding bill, pass it back to the House. Um, but on the other front, Walls is not being, uh, I think, he's not following his own rules is the best way to put it. There was even a picture of him yesterday in a restaurant without a mask after they just find a restaurant $7,000 for somebody not having a mask. We are on day 207 of 15 days to flatten the curve and people are getting tired. Our businesses up here, and I've been to many of them that have shown me their plan to open safe, open secure, and open and keep all of their patrons safe. We can do this, we've proven we can do it. I just wish we could get an ear in the executive branch so that they would listen and so that these people, so that the, the Walls administration knows these people can do it because we've shown we can do it safe on many fronts. Thank you, Justin. All right, our next question will be from Heidi and Justin, you'll have a chance to answer first. <clears throat> The Leech Lake Reservation is within your district. What is your understanding of Ojibwe treaty rights and the relationship between tribal and state governments, especially during this pandemic? Well, treaty rights are certainly very important and something we should always look to. Uh, I, it, I've had a great working relationship with the chairman of the band, uh, whether it be on some of the bills I carried to help the tribe or whether it be on this. Again, they should still have right over their own sovereignty. And in a lot of cases, they have decided to make the same decisions that the state has made, and that's fine. We should still give them their anonymity to be able to do that and then continue to work with the tribes. Like I worked very hard with the tribe on uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women bill, which I thought was very important. I worked very hard with the tribe to make sure that a veterans memorial on Leech Lake was able to stay there. I worked very hard with the tribe on many other small issues they had 
Uh, they also have a law enforcement issue they're working on. We went and toured their facility there. So going forward, what, go, in the past, their sovereignty is good. We should make sure that's upheld. Going forward, we should continue to be a partner with the tribe. And that's the way I have worked in the Senate. And that's the way I'll continue to work. Uh, we'll keep working with their law enforcement folks as well to make sure that what they want to do to have their sovereignty there is also protected. So I think we've done some good things um, and built really good relationships with the band so that way we can be partners uh, from the state level government perspective. Thank you, Justin. Rita, your answer? My understanding of Leech Lake Band and all of the indigenous uh, tribes in the state is, of course, their treaty rights matter and their tribal sovereignty is something that we want to continue to support and, and respect. My experience with Leech Lake is as a former employee at Leech Lake Band, I have worked with them closely and I understand some of the challenges that they're facing and they're not unlike the rest of our district, including making sure that their members have have jobs that pay well and making sure that they are able to provide housing on the reservation and, and for their members. And so we want to make sure that we're working closely with the tribe, that we're um, communicating directly with them, because I think that's important, and, and that we're listening to the concerns and the issues that are important to them. Some of those include uh, making sure that we're addressing um, issues that are challenges across our district, including opioid use and that kind of thing. Making sure that we're coordinating with law enforcement, which we of course do uh, with the Paul Bunyan Drug Task Force that is included with Leech Lake and all of our law enforcement across this district. And then uh, for sure, understanding their uh, sovereign rights and their, um, their goals for the tribe, as far as their environment and what's happening with uh, a clean, in, you know, moving to a clean energy future, making sure that uh, we're supporting their work uh, for um, taking care of their lands and also, you know, working with them in their forestry area. I know that they are working right now with uh, foresters at the state and at the federal level to make sure that they can um, create a, um, and they, they really want to return to a more historic red and white pine forest. And so those natural resource issues, whether that's forestry or um, making sure that we have habitat for snowshoe hare and being able to have blueberry picking, those are some of those traditional efforts that they do, but also making sure that uh, their water is clean as well. Thanks, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal? Oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention before, and that was some of the work we did on the bonding project with both the band, the city of Deer River, and the Senate. We do have that in the, we had it in the Senate's bonding bill. If we do get a bonding bill, it will still be in there. So the other thing that I think is important is fostering those relationships between the local units of government, the band, and the state. And again, something I look forward to continuing to do. Uh, I built those relationships over the last four years. And Leech Lake really does have a great legislative team that they bring down there. And I always appreciate their discussion and they always have my ear. All right, thank you, Justin. Rita, rebuttal? I just would say that I think the Deer River project's been on the books for about 10 years. And that is a project in cooperation with Leech Lake Band because they'd like to expand White Oak Casino and they're not able to because their wastewater treatment facility is not has doesn't have the capacity. And so, you know, that's been on the books for 10 years. Justin's been in office for four years and they still don't have that project done. So that's just another example of not getting a bonding bill done for the people of Northern Minnesota. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the next question. The next question will come from Dennis Wyman and Rita, you'll have a chance to answer first. Okay, thanks Bethany. Thanks to both of you for joining us today. I, in regards to the economy, proponents of the $2.9 billion Enbridge Line 3 pipeline project say it would generate 4,200 well-paying union jobs and bring in $20 million annually in property taxes to the 13 Minnesota counties it crosses. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission has approved the project saying the new pipeline would be safer and pose less risk to the environment than the current pipeline. But the project remains hung up in appeals. The latest one came in August and is the second time Governor Walls, the Minnesota Department of Commerce have appealed. Wall said in a statement that the state must follow the process, the law, and the science for any project that impacts Minnesota's environment and economy. He says the Department of Commerce's appeal is a part of that process, and it's important to ensure clarity in the steps that Minnesota takes to evaluate and approve projects like this one. 
do you support the project moving forward or do you feel the delays are warranted? Thanks for that question. I know it's on a lot of people's mind and I do support replacing line three. We want to make sure that we're transitioning to a clean energy future and away from fossil fuels. But right now we're still using oil. We're using oil to transport uh, oil for, uh, we're using oil for road building, transportation, national defense, and moving oil through a pipeline is the best and safest way. Line three existing right now is needed, needing replacement. It needs to be decommissioned and there's three reasons that I'm supporting this and, and jobs is a, a icing on the cake, but really number one is the safety of line three. And we want to make sure if we're going to move oil, we want to have it safe. A new pipe would be thicker, have more monitoring and be safer uh, in the long run. Number two, Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe would like to have that removed from the reservation and line and Enbridge has actually said to any property owner who wants the line removed, they will do that once the new line is built. And so I support Leech Lake Band in that effort to remove line three from the reservation. And then finally, I know that Minnesota is proud to have some of the most um, modern and up-to-date environmental protection laws that really protect our environment. I worked with the folks that are reviewing the permit applications, uh, and I know them to be professional, transparent, and rigorous in their review. And I know that they've been meeting in the field with Enbridge engineers to make sure that if there is a sensitive area, that we are avoiding it, that we are mitigating, or we are replacing any impacts that might have uh, taken place. So, so besides the fact that it'll provide jobs, it really is the best thing to do to make sure that we are moving oil in a safe way. But generally we wanna move from away from fossil fuels and into a more clean energy future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Rita. Justin, your answer? Quite simply to answer the question, do I support or do I think the delays are good? Dennis, I 110% support line three. It should be going now, which should already be done. It's went through one of the most rigorous processes in state history. Um, it's unfortunate that the Walls administration continues to keep stalling this project. Walls did say when he was campaigning for governor that you know, he stood in Bemidji, he stood in Grand Rapids and said if it follows the process, he wouldn't stand in the way. And now you've got two of his state agencies suing each other, which is gonna cost the state millions of dollars for us to sue ourselves. That's just unconscionable. It doesn't make any sense at all for something that has had so many public hearings, everybody that wanted a voice has gotten a voice in this over the last several years. This line is in the ground in other states. Now Enbridge did do the right thing working with the Leech Lake Band to make sure that the new route would go around Leech Lake and that they would be removing some of the old pipe from Leech Lake. The new line is going to be the safest way to move this oil that we greatly need right now. And it's, it's really unfortunate, right? I, I recently got the 49ers endorsement, which I'm really proud of. Those are the hardworking folks that care so much, not only about their environment and their jobs, they care equally as much about both. So this project is extremely important to them. I think that uh, when Governor Walls said that this project needed to have a social permit, based on all the public hearings, this project has received its social permit. It's time to get out of the way and start letting the good hardworking people of Northern Minnesota get back to work, put this line in its billions in infrastructure. It's more than building a Viking stadium. And that's an economic boost to Northern Minnesota that we greatly need right now because of what's happened with the pandemic. So with that said again, I 110% support Enbridge. I will continue to do so. And I will continue to push back against the bureaucracy that intends to kill it. Thank you, Justin. Rita, a rebuttal? I agree that I think businesses need regulatory certainty, and that means when there's a process in place, when they submit a permit application, the permit is reviewed, and uh, they are provided with the opportunity to um, improve on what their plan is, and, and Enbridge has done that, and people have had the opportunity to respond and comment on it, that the legislature and uh, the governor should not stand in the way of the regulatory process that we have. So I support the, the completion of line three, and I believe that it will move forward. And uh, that's something that uh, we all want to have completed and done and in the ground. And we do appreciate those jobs because there are a number of, of uh, local, not only workers that will benefit from it, but also 
a lot of uh, folks will um, be in our area spending money at our gas stations, at our hardware stores, and, and at our hotels and restaurants. So we want to make sure that that project gets off its feet, gets on its feet, and gets out the door. Thank you, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal? Yes, um, I will say again, extremely important. I support an all of the above energy approach for Northern Minnesota, whether that's with line three, with Boswell, we need a diverse energy and line three is a part of that. I just get worried and a lot of folks get worried uh, with Rita that, you know, would she vote with the DFL caucus who strongly opposes line three, at least the metro part of the caucus does, or would you vote with the district? And I would continue to vote with the district. I've heard so many times that the, as as we're out talking to people, um, line three is probably the number two issue we're hearing at the doors right now. People are so concerned and they just so badly wanna get back to work and they realize that the process has been followed. And we see this in other projects as well in Northern Minnesota, but it's time to stop. It's time to get Minnesota back to work. And this is one great way to do it. All right, thank you. Our next question will come from Matthew and Justin, you'll have the option to answer first. I actually want to stay on this topic a little more and, and go to more of a bit of a macro level in a sense. I wanted to ask, um, what um, is your thoughts on how the legislature should approach the topic of climate change? Uh, should the legislature have a role in combating climate change? And if so, what would that be? Well, certainly the leg legislature at the state level should have a role and anything it wants to. I mean, we've been given that authority by the 10th Amendment of the Constitution. Should we tackle climate change? To some degree, probably, but we've seen climate change throughout all of history. Before humans were even here, there were, you know, Minnesota was covered with ice. So uh, the climate we've seen change throughout history to how much human involvement it is, is certainly within question. There's certainly science on both sides of the issue. That discussion should continue to happen in St. Paul. We should listen. There are certainly both sides of folks on that issue. Um, it's important to keep an open ear and we should always want and have and strive for a cleaner, better environment, regardless of what the science says on either side of it. It's so important for our tourism up here to have those that clean environment. So it is something we should be concerned about. Even if you take climate change out of the question, we should always be concerned about clean air, clean water, uh, but there's definitely a way that we can do what we do up here, do it well, and have both a clean environment, clean air, clean water, and the industries that are so important to Northern Minnesota and our trucks and SUVs and those type of things. So yes, um, we should talk about it, but um, it should be at the discussion level more than legislating something that may or may not have a big effect. All right, thank you, Justin. Rita, your answer. Thank you. Climate change is real and it does need to be addressed. And I'm shocked that Justin would suggest that this is a question of whether or not there is a there is an effect on our environment from from us because we know that it is uh, proven and, and uh, that it is actually something that we should be concerned about right now. So I really support the transition to a clean energy future with and away from fossil fuels like um, you know, like coal and, and, and oil, because we know that if we can transition to wind and solar and, and things like um, carbon free fuels like woody biomass, that that is a good. We can see the changes in our environment every day. So when we have warmer, wetter winters, loggers can't get in the woods. They can't freeze down their roads. They can't uh, cut the black spruce in the swamp. When we have warmer summers, we have blowdown and, and big storms that are affecting our timber resources. When our waters are warming in our lakes, that's affecting our fisheries and all of the, you know, the um, commerce that goes along with having a great resorts and lake life and, and fisheries. So we have to pay attention to that. And the best way to do that, number one, is to conserve energy because when you, that's the cheapest and quickest way is to conserve energy and, and do a better job of that. But we also need to be transitioning to different fuels. And one of the opportunities we have in this region is to transition to woody biomass because there's excess biomass in our plants at our mills. There's excess biomass in logging operations. And there is also 
uh, you know, timber standing dead on the stump, our, the larch beetle or our tamarack are dying in great swaths across our region because of the larch beetle. And that's partly because of climate change and those, in, those uh, you know, invasive species that are affecting our resources. Those also create a fire hazard in our region. So we have to focus on how do we get a handle on reducing our energy use. All right. Thank you, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal? Yeah, I'm really disappointed to hear we want to get completely get rid of coal from Rita because we do have a coal-fired power plant uh, just outside of Cohasset. That's the Boswell Energy Center. That is one of the cleanest coal-fired power plants in America, and they just spent hundreds of millions to do that. Uh, we can have mining and clean water and clean air, and the coal-fired power plant is a part of that. I'm not sure how windmills are going to keep the mines open, but they, the answer is they won't. So it is important to have an all of the above approach to energy. Do we certainly need to be cleaner? Yes, windmills should be part of the mix. Solar should be part of the mix. Nuclear should be part of the mix, hydro. But we shouldn't be shutting down a huge economic driver for this district just because we don't like coal and because the Democrat party doesn't like coal. It's too important to this area and needs to be part of the all of the above approach. And that is what people as I am out talking to people are asking for. We need to have an all of the above approach. We need base load power. So we need to make sure that kind of stuff is not shut down. Thank you, Justin. Rita, a rebuttal? Well, putting words in my mouth isn't going to be uh, make it so because I didn't say that we're going to shut down Clay Boswell because I know that that powers the range and we, that we need that. What we need to do is transition away from coal because we know that even though those uh, upgrades have made a difference in the amount of mercury going into the air from coal, we continue to see that we have fish in our fisheries that we can't eat because of mercury pollution. But really we need to have a phased effect so that we can transition from coal to cleaner, to cleaner kinds of fuels. And those are the things that uh, folks at St. Paul need to focus on because honestly, we have, uh, we have a, a crisis on our hands that if we don't start making changes now, our future is not gonna be a bright future for our loggers, for our people that live here and wanna work and, and recreate in this area or for our children. So let's take a hard look at this. Let's find a way to make sure that we are doing all we can to address climate change and to make a bright future for our communities. All right. Thank you. We're going to move on to our fifth question from Heidi with Rita answering first. Mental health services for youth and adults are limited in northern Minnesota with a pandemic and economic downturn and other changes in our daily lives and the culture. More and more people are in need. Could you talk about that and and tell us if you have solutions for how people can get more help? Thanks. I, recent, I, I agree that we need uh, to, to address this issue because mental health is health care. I think we need to start thinking about the whole body health care. And that means let's connect the head, the mouth for dental care and the body with our physical care. Because why would we separate out all of these different kinds of health care that people need? It is our whole body that we need to be treating. I recently spoke with uh, folks at uh, Kiesler Wellness Center and also at North Holmes to talk about the work that they do to provide mental health services in our region. And some of the things that we've been able to do in, in spite of the, the pandemic and maybe in, in because of it is to provide telehealth services that weren't available before because we got waivers uh, through the emergency powers from COVID that uh, we could do telehealth services. And, and that's been a real help to those organizations. But we have to make sure that we are supporting those um, professionals who are providing mental health services. And right now I know that, um, for example, state reimbursement for some mental health professionals doesn't meet the cost of their services. So we could look at that. And we also need to make sure that we are uh, talking to folks in our schools and that our young people who need that care are, are being taken care of. Here in this community, Evergreen Family and Youth Services provides services for young people who are struggling and who have issues. And those are the kinds of projects and, and um, places that we need to support to make sure that everyone is receiving the care they need. Mental health care is health care. And to suggest that we should be separate 
doesn't make sense. So we all want our neighbors to be taken care of and uh, them to have the health care they need to be safe and secure. And that's what we can do with mental health care too. Thank you, Rita. Justin, your answer. Well, as we think about mental health, it is one of the issues that normally comes to the top of the list uh, in a normal election cycle. Obviously, with everything going on, we don't hear about it as much, but it's extremely important. But where we do hear about mental health, at least in the last six months, is the mental health of both our seniors and our students. With lockdowns and families being shut out of nursing homes, uh, so many people that are living in assisted living facilities are dealing with mental health challenges. And that, again, is unconscionable. There needs to be services we could provide to help those folks and find and continue to find safe ways for loved ones to be able to get back in. On the K-12 front, uh, people between the ages of 18 and 25, as high as 25% of that age group uh, is claiming depression. And part of that, a large part of it is because of the shutdowns. They've been locked out from their friends and they are dealing with more challenges and other things as they continue to grow up that you know these shutdowns make even worse. Um, things we can do, things we have worked on. One of the things that I thought was really great is we started doing some regional mental health centers. Some of that was paid for with bonding dollars. That's a step in the right direction. Uh, I carried a bill that would help people who are dealing with mental health challenges be able to stay in the workplace, to be able to work with those people's employers to be able to stay in the workplace because that's a committee I serve on on jobs. There are steps we need to continue to make. There is no magic bullet to make you know, mental health good immediately. Um, but there are a lot of things we can keep doing and we should keep doing. And it's a discussion that should be have. And it's one of the most important discussions we need to continue to have in St. Paul. But again, we really need to start talking about what we can do to help those that are the most greatly affected currently. And right now that's our seniors and our K through 12 students. Thank you, Justin. Rita, any rebuttal? I agree that we, I think we agree that mental health services are important to have. The, the challenge is that we need to figure out how to not just carry a bill or author a bill, but get the bill over the line and make sure that, that uh, we're, we're um, providing those services that we need. And right now, uh, you know, the Republicans uh, desire to kick people off of Minnesota care and, and the other health care that they need is not going to be helping our folks that need mental health care and need the care they need. So let's let's make sure that we're talking about making sure that our families and our kids, our seniors, as I agree, they need to have that care. But trying to kick off people from their health care doesn't seem to be the way to get it done. Thank you, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal? One minute's probably not enough for that, but I'll make it work. Um, as far as getting bills across the finish line, the bills I referenced were bills that actually got across the finish line and were signed into law, which I think is very important. And again, we still need to continue to make those steps. So I will continue to work there. And I think, it, it, again, at least everybody agrees it's important. You know, mental health shouldn't be a, a partisan issue, but obviously uh, it's starting to get there. And then also for the record, nobody is trying to, in the Republican Party, trying to kick anybody off of any of the, you know, Minnesota care or any of that, nobody's trying to kick anybody off of that. And pre-existing conditions have been covered in Minnesota for a long period of time. And everybody in the Republican caucus will continue to support pre-existing conditions. They will stay there. Nobody's gonna take it away. Don't let Rita tell you otherwise. All right, we'll move on to question six as a friendly reminder. If you do want more time, you do have an extra minute you can use at some point. Dennis, question for Justin first. Hey, thanks, Bethany. Uh, both of you have experience in government. Justin, you're currently serving in the state Senate. And uh, Rita, you are, have been a longtime Bemidji mayor. How has that experience working in government helped you? And how would that help you in this seat? And then also, you both have records to stand on with, with your governing. Uh, is there anything about your opponent that concerns you regarding the record? Justin's up to first. me, Dennis. Yeah, oh, thank Justin's you. First. So I think my experience in government has been very great. One thing I learned is how to work across the aisle. Uh, more than 60% of my bills have been bipartisan. I consistently work with the range delegation because, you know, they share a lot of uh, similar ideas about what our areas are and what and the people we serve. And that's a bipartisan delegation, half Republican, half Democrat. So we've worked really hard to do things bipartisanly. And I think that's an important thing to do. As far as concerns, I'm already concerned um, 
about the Boswell Energy site. And she did say that coal should go away. I don't know how we're going to run the mines on a windmill. You can't run a mine or a paper mill or a sawmill on a windmill or a solar panel. At some point, we got to get to the realization we need to get and make things better. And we can continue to do that the way Boswell did. They're a good actor. We should be holding up Minnesota Power and Boswell for the investments they made. They did a good thing. We should encourage others to do what they did. But you can't just willy nilly say it's gone and, you know, magically things are going to work out. We need that baseload power here to have the industries we need. Very, very concerning on that front. There's many other things I'm concerned about. Uh, we're going to need more than two minutes for that, though. So I won't go into it. Um, but there is a laundry list of things, whether it's with law enforcement, with the raising of taxes, with you know, crime, all those other things that we've seen in the city of Bemidji, we don't want those things coming statewide. So yeah, I do have a level of concern and the people I've been talking to, and these aren't just Republican people, these are people in the middle of the road that I meet on the street are very concerned and rightfully so. So they should be concerned about their government and it's good they're concerned, but they're concerned with what they've seen happen in the city of Bemidji currently. So they're right to be concerned with what could happen at the state level. All right, thank you, Justin. Rita, your answer. Thanks, Dennis, for that question because Bemidji is a great community. I'm proud to be its mayor and we're proud of the work that we've done in Bemidji to make it a community where people wanna live, businesses wanna locate. So our population has been growing over the last, uh, since the last census so by about 12%. That, and that means that people wanna live in this community because it is a great community that, that offers opportunity for jobs. It's got, a, got great amenities and uh, they know that this is a place that they can find a job, go to school and, and live and work and raise their kids because it's, uh, it's, it's a community that cares about others. As I mentioned in my opening, we've been uh, growing our tax base here. So a lot of folks wonder how do you get things done when there's so many things to do? And one of the ways that we have done it in Bemidji is we grow our tax base. So you grow that pie and that is an, uh, the ability to make sure that our, our um, businesses can expand, that we have added dozens of new businesses in our community. We've added new jobs with Delta Dental, our airport has expanded to make sure that we have that amenity that we need. And we've experienced that growth in part because this is a good community to live in. Expanding our, our, our community and growing our pie helps us keep our tax rate low. So over the last eight years, our taxes have been some of the lowest in the region. And in the last five years, we've kept our tax rate flat. In other words, if your business or your uh, property did not ex in increase in value, then you didn't have any tax increase from the city. So we've been supportive of business, we've been supportive of our parks, and we've uh, been supportive of our partners in the community like Bemidji State University. The fact that I've been a, a mayor for eight years and I've always supported our public safety uh, and the equipment and, and uh, resources that they need speaks volumes. So we, I'm proud of our community. It's a great place to live and uh, we want to continue to make it a good place to live. Thank you, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal? Yes, it's interesting uh, about growing the tax base, but I do believe there's uh, many folks that are now going to be in the city limits that are frustrated by annexation. That's certainly one way to grow the tax base and say that it's not raising the taxes. The other question, and from many, many folks I've talked to in Bemidji are frustrated. They would disagree with the statement that the taxes haven't gone up. Uh, and people are asking how many times in even just the last you know, eight years have the taxes been raised just to cover the deficit at the Sanford Center. And then on the business front, businesses are very concerned. And when business owners speak out, they're called Luddites if they don't agree with what the city wants to do. So I just think that it, it doesn't feel correct in the statement that was made. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, we don't need to raise anybody's taxes in this time of a pandemic, in this time of a down economy. We need to be working with the business owners to make sure that they have what they need to succeed so we can keep Northern Minnesota running after it's allowed to be open. Thank you, Justin. Rita, a rebuttal? Bemidji is a great community. People are, Sanford Health is hiring about 100 people a year. Bemidji State University is one of the only universities in the system that has kept their enrollment up. 
And uh, we are adding businesses every year, uh, new, new businesses on our main street and new businesses on our commercial um, strip. So we know that people want to locate in Bemidji and people want to live and work in Bemidji. And that's why uh, that uh, I'm proud of being uh, mayor of Bemidji. I'm proud of the fact that we have renovated our parks, that we have brought in outside money to help with that, including state grants for park development at the downtown and state grants for park development at the uh, South Shore. And we have also continued to support our law enforcement as we always have. I'm the only candidate in the race with a 10 year record of always supporting a law enforcement budget for the equipment and the and the needs that they have. And, and so Bemidji is a great place to live and don't and let anyone tell you otherwise. All right, thank you, Rita. Our next question will come from Matthew and Rita, you'll answer first. My question is related to childcare. Uh, there was recently a task force in Bemidji that studied childcare and found that providers are looking for more flexibility. One of the specifics they mentioned was more flexibility in terms of uh, the age ranges of children they can take care of um, to allow more flexibility in how many children they can take care of at a time. I'm wondering what your positions are on expanding the flexibility of childcare through reforms. Childcare is an issue that I've heard about a lot across the district as I'm visiting with voters because people want to be able to work and they need to have a safe place for their kids if they're going to work. So my son and daughter-in-law actually have in-home licensed childcare. And so I know a little bit about the challenges of permitting it and, and getting it off the ground and starting that. And, uh, and so I have some ideas on how that could be streamlined as well. The idea that we could perhaps shift uh, the age groups that uh, caregivers could, could take care of is one opportunity. I know that came out of that tax force and that's one opportunity, but I think we need to look at what is our um, goal for childcare and how do we make sure that we can support childcare providers make sure that children continue to be safe, that families can afford to have childcare. And I know that in some cases, our um, childcare providers, the cost that it costs them every day for each child is not fully reimbursed from those that are um, state pay users of our system. So we wanna make sure that we're reimbursing those childcare providers in a way that is making sense for them and supporting their business. And, and also, you know, how, what are the other options for childcare? One of them is to expand pre-K education and to be able to have kids be at the, at, in a learning environment at their young ages, because we know that's a win-win for our communities. When you get kids into early education, they are much more successful in school. They are more apt to graduate from high school and be successful. And so, that helps our, our kids, our families, and our communities have successful kids. So um, expanding pre-K is, is another option for helping our, our child care providers do a good work for our families. All right. Thank you, Rita. Justin, your answer. Matthew, thank you for the question. That is something that was top of mind for a lot of folks, especially before COVID, and it's starting to come back now that folks are starting to go back in the workplace. So it is very important that task force was important. That task force definitely has more work to do. Uh, one thing we are hearing a lot, especially from the in-home providers, is that government continue to get in the way too much. So we need to find ways to get government back out of the way. Um, our agencies were making confusing rules. Now we need to make sure that as these are done, they're vetted. They should probably be vetted maybe instead of uh, at the agency level, maybe in the legislature. We need to make sure that rules are in place to keep kids safe but also rules that make sense that people can follow and have a place to go to. Um, many of these childcare providers, especially the in-home ones, get told one thing by one individual in government and another thing by another individual in government, and they've got a fine from one individual here in government. And it's just, it's all over the place. So we need to have a set of rules that's easy for in-home providers to understand. We are losing so many of those folks right now it's sad, there will be no place for them to go. And if we want economic development in our areas, childcare needs to be a part of the mix. The government should not be the childcare provider. Those are best served in those small centers or in the in-home settings. And then the other thing, you know, if, if you look at even a kindergarten classroom, if a kindergarten teacher can have 20 kids, why can't we look at the size of daycare providers, what they can handle? 
most of those individuals are saying, hey, we could have more kids in these age ranges. We can do this safely. We should start listening to the child care providers. And that's why we're starting to, or have been, and will continue to hold these hearings with that child care working group. And hopefully legislation will be forthcoming. We probably would have had some legislation in 2020 had it not been uh, for COVID. We hope to work on that in 2021 because there are things we can do. Again, no magic bullet here, but there's things we can and should continue to do. And I'm ready and willing to keep working on it. All right, Rita, it'll be your chance for rebuttal. And just as a heads up, this will be our last question. So after these, we'll move on to closing comments. So go ahead, Rita. Thanks. Uh I will I say that we both agree that child care is an important thing because we need to have everybody who wants to work to be able to work and be contributing into our economy and being able to take care of their families, making sure that they can pay the rent, making sure they can fix the car and 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 pay for health care. And that's why families want to know that their health care or their child care location is safe. And that's the main reason that the state is in the game of trying to permit these child care centers, because we want to make sure that families can feel confident that when they take their kids to the child care center and they drop them off, that they're going to be safe. They're going to be well fed. They're going to be cared for. And when they come back in the afternoon, they're going to be happy to see mom and dad. So we want to continue to make sure that we have rules and regulations that keep our kids safe, but also that are effective for our child care providers because we want to make sure those child care slots continue to be available because everybody wants to be able to have a safe place to put their kids and be able to have a job to take care of their families. Thank you, Rita. Justin, a rebuttal. As a parent of four young, wonderful kids, I know that you know safety is paramount, especially when we're talking about you know somebody taking care of somebody else's kids so we'll keep working in that aspect we'll keep working to do things to help make the child care industry better and keep working with our partners there the in-home and the centers to make sure that there's rules that are not confusing things that are easy to follow and there's somebody that they can talk to if there is an issue and an outlet for parents to be able to do the same so ready and willing to keep working on that all right thank you guys That'll conclude the question portion. We're gonna move on to closing comments. So closing comments first come from Justin, two minutes each. There we go, had to get unmuted again. I thought it was Rita first. So closing comments. Thank you again to Lakeland for doing this. So important. This will probably be the only debate we end up having. So we appreciate the time you guys put in to do this. Again, I'm your state Senator, Justin Eichhorn. I would be honored for with your vote to be able to continue to serve you for another two years in St. Paul. There's so much work left to do. Um, I can tell you that I'm pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, pro-labor, pro-mining, pro-line three. I'm for less government, less taxes, and more freedom. And I am the only law enforcement endorsed candidate in this race. And I think that's important based on what we're seeing going on in Minneapolis and St. Paul right now. I can tell you that your SD5 team, myself, Spencer Igo and Matt Bliss, are ready to work as a team for you the same way that I did with Sandy Lehman and Matt Bliss in the past. We will carry bills together. We will work together. We will talk with each other every day and make sure that your voice is heard and carry forward in St. Paul. I appreciate you folks listening this evening. I want to thank those of you at home that listen to this debate. If you have any questions about me, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. I would love the opportunity to earn your vote and would love to have your vote this November. Thank you again. Thank you, Justin. Rita, your closing comments. Thanks again for everyone here, all of our moderator, the moderator, mm -hmm. Bethany, and our question askers. I appreciate it. So thanks tonight for watching and thank you to Lakeland Public Television for sponsoring the debate. I appreciate the questions and the opportunity for you to get to know me. No matter where you live in Senate District 5, we pretty much all want the same things for our families. We want jobs that pay well, our kids to have great schools, and access to good housing and affordable health care. That's what I'll focus on as your state senator. You work hard for your family and I will work hard for you because that's what I've always done. I didn't get a handout from mom and dad before my start. What I got from them is knowing the value of hard work and persistence, like working two and three jobs to afford college, working long shifts at our restaurant to make it successful and stepping up to serve my community as mayor. I'll take that leadership experience to St. Paul to focus on jobs and economic development in Northern Minnesota and repair the disparity in education funding and work to lower healthcare costs while keeping our pre-existing condition protections and reining in the cost of prescription drugs. I wanna make sure that our communities continue to thrive and we protect our outdoor heritage and continue our Northern Minnesota traditions of hunting, fishing, 
and recreating in the Northland. Well-funded outside groups, people who don't live here are really spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to scare you and keep you from voting. Don't let them take that away. Be a voter, make sure you get to the polls and vote. What living through a crisis has shown us is that we need steady leadership that is focusing on bridging divides instead of making them deeper. I humbly ask for your support. Check out our campaign at readitforsenate.com. Please vote Rita for Al Albright for Minnesota Senate. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Rita. On behalf of all of us here at Lakeland PBS, I want to thank our candidates, Senator Justin Eichhorn and Rita Albright, for joining us this evening and participating in Debate Night 2020. This marked the third of nine state legislative debates that will be featured this week here on Lakeland PBS. I hope you stay with us for our final debate tonight and join us later this week as we hear from other candidates in our coverage area. If you miss any portion of tonight's debate or like to watch it again, it'll be available on the Lakeland PBS website within 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. Also, be sure to read a recap of tonight's debate in Saturday's Bemidji Pioneer or online at bemidjipioneer.com. But don't go anywhere just yet. In just a few minutes at 9 p.m., we'll have the debate for State House District 5A featuring Representative John Purcell from the Democratic Farmer Labor Party and Matt Bliss from the Republican Party. Thank you, everyone. Stay with us in just a few minutes. We'll be right back.